Hello and welcome to Admissions Live. I'm broadcasting live from uh, my favorite hotel brand, Marriott International. Uh, I am on travel currently, um, hitting up the road just like many of you are, I'm sure. Um, so hopefully you're uh, taking a break, you're not at a fair tonight, and you're tuning in to watch Admissions Live, your weekly web show for college admissions professionals. We're part of the Higher Ed Live Network, which is all about digital development and professional empowerment. We've got Gil Rogers on tonight's show, and we're talking about prospective student communications. The Zinch team has a lot of research that they've been sharing throughout this past year, and I wanted to get them on the show to share it with me. Um, so I want to get right to do that, but we can't start without giving a huge thank you to those sponsors that make Admissions Live possible. Admissions Live is sponsored by Welcome to College, who believe it's all in the visit and have created web and mobile applications to help institutions measure and manage their most critical recruitment tool, the college visit. Travel season is underway, you know it, and Marisa from the Welcome to College team has written a great blog post about making the most of the college fair season, so you can check out her perspective on the Welcome to College blog. Admissions Live is sponsored by Integral, the creators of the school's app on Facebook. Check out their webinar series about how private social networks can increase yield and retention. That happens Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and we just sent out a tweet with a link to register for that. Admissions Live is sponsored by Scavenger, a Google-funded mobile game about going places, doing challenges, and earning points. If you're headed to NACAC, uh, that national conference in Denver next week, don't miss out on Scavenger. Um, you can play and compete to win some sweet prizes, and we sent out a link to tell you how to do that. Um, so hopefully we are going to be seeing you in Denver soon. And last, but certainly never least, Admissions Live is sponsored by Zinch, a Chegg service that introduces students to best fit schools and scholarships. Zinch and Chegg have teamed up with Schmoop to offer six months of PSAT, SAT, or, S or ACT prep to students uh, that sign up before December 31st. Um, so you can visit the link that we just tweeted out, or you can email Rob Wellington, and he's at rob at zinch.com. That's his email. Um, and you can email Rob with, for more information about that. All right. So tonight we've got one of my favorite people and sponsors. Um, he's hashtag Gil. <laughs> he's Gil Rogers, um, the director of marketing and outreach at Zinch. And he just took off his hat. So what? You want to leave it on? No one's going to get my hashtag Gil comment. Uh, oh, I didn't know you were showing me already. Here yeah, we go. Yeah, you're on. You're on Here now. Welcome. Sweet Thank hat. you. Thank I you. I think I'm going to need one of those. Welcome to the um, Zinch that? Hartford office, I suppose. Yes, which is your home. Absolutely. Your, Absolutely. Your Captain your America Shield home. in tow. Yes. My uncle's name is Steve Rogers, actually. That's kind of why it's there. Anyway, nice. so hi. Thanks for having hi. me. Thanks for coming. You guys Absolutely. have been up to so much lately, um, presenting all over the place. Um, Lots of different kinds of research, too, I can't even keep up. So hopefully you can give us um, a big summary of what you've been up to and kind of uh, synthesize all of this amazing research into one uh, half-hour show with me. You think we can do that? Absolutely. Either that or we just keep talking and see how long people listen. One of the two. One of the two works. Yeah, absolutely. So when I came to Zinch a little over a year ago, um, I came from the admissions side, you know, working at the University of New Haven and Hartford in Connecticut. Um, one of the things that I always wanted to do when I was supervising our admission staff, and it was funny, we were talking about this before, you know, as you stay in the office, you gain more responsibilities. So then you have to juggle all these other things while still doing your job of travel and going the Hyatt and admissions live shows and everything else. But one of the things that I never really got to do that I wanted to do was evaluate the outreach met methods and the tactical things we were doing to really yep. be able to say, okay, this is working, let's keep doing it. Yep. This isn't working, we let's stop doing it. And it's really hard to do that when you're putting out fires and reading applications and traveling and doing all those things. So when I came to Zinch, I had the freedom and flexibility to really focus on doing that kind of research so that hopefully admissions offices that sit in conference presentations. I, I presented at a ton of regional conferences last spring and we're presenting at NACAC next week um, on our kind of overall student uh, perspectives in their, in their college search. And the idea was that what we wanted to do is find out is there a number of times a student needs to be contacted before it influences their decision 
to apply and ultimately enroll in an institution. Kind of like the old sales metrics of, you know, it takes seven points of contact to get someone to buy. Or, you know, if you contact 100 people, 10 will be interested and one will buy, like that kind of thing. So yep. we wanted to look at it that way. Um, but yeah, what we found is that... Well, wait, before you dive in, I want to talk yeah. about this doing research thing because, yeah. I mean, you bring up a really great point. And um, when I was down at NACAC headquarters this past summer, we were talking about exactly that thing. Um, and... Um, talking about schools that have good relationships with their institutional research, uh, you know, uh, places on campus that are able to partner with them and do research. And uh, I have to say that I, I don't see that connection um, with our enrollment division. And maybe it's because I'm not at the level to really interact with that. But um, it is a challenge to be able to put together research on your own. And um, a lot of times, there's not the resources out there that are putting together research. So I just wanted to kind of pause and commend you for doing that. Um, and for um, picking something that's so important and, and really picking on communication, because as communication is changing so rapidly um, with new technology um, and students' behaviors are changing. Um, if we're not investing in research, we're certainly not going to be able to keep up. So I just wanted to kind of thank you for doing that because thank you. Um, I don't think we would have the capacity to do those things. And yeah. I hope that when people are at conferences, they're not discounting some of these presentations um, from you know, outside sources that are providing really solid research. So yeah. um, hopefully well, that's, that's an important that. note, especially, especially on conferences right. is that, you know, a lot of conferences you go to, a lot of the presentations are going to be vendor sponsored. I prefer the term strategic enrollment partner, but <laughs> vendor sponsored presentations. And some yeah. of them are going to be cheesy sales pitches, come buy our product, that sort of stuff. Right. But I, I mean, as long as, as long as I'm at Zinch, my perspective is, is because we have access to 4 million students' um, contact information and the ability to survey them, it's our responsibility to do this type of research and be able to provide it. And I, every presentation I gave has zero kind of sales perspective uh, on it. It's always about our student research. I and mean, we just did a social, we just did a research study with Integral mm -hmm. on this, and we called it the 2012 Social Media Report. And that was the, kind of the second our social admissions report, rather. Um, and the social admissions report was really focused on how students are using social media and how they're using it for their college search. Yep. And it really had nothing to do with Zinch or Integral specifically. Right. Yeah, a little bit because Zinch is a network for students and it's the it's the network that they use for re requesting information and connecting with colleges. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Integral does the school's app for yield and retention, but it was right. really about what, what network students are using and how they're using it for their search. So we really focus on on, on relevant research. And it's funny you mentioned about institutional research. Our institutional research was actually in our admissions building mm -hmm. at New Haven. And they we still weren't able to do a whole lot of great research with yeah. them because they're they're so busy doing other things. You yeah. know, and it's it's just it's, to be fair, it's like they're they have a million and a half things going on. We have a million and a half things going on. So it's really important to leverage the research that people like Zinch or Noel Levitz or College Board comes out with because it's really some useful information to help you with with making decisions with regard to your budget. I mean nobody's budget's getting bigger. You know, it's about investing those budget that budget into important things that are working. Exactly. And I can remember when I was first going out to conferences as a newbie, um, some of these regional ACAC conferences and picking sessions that I had interest in and not thinking about who was presenting and then realizing that, hey, there are these other outside groups doing research. And I would then go out and look for that. Are, are these people presenting on a white paper that they put together? That's something that I would actively go and seek out. But um, so I hope others have the same feeling. And if not, I'm going to encourage you all to do that and especially check out the presentations that are happening next week um, out at NACAC. And if you're not out at NACAC, I'm going to hopefully be bringing that information to you while I'm out there. So yeah, follow the hashtag, hashtag NACAC12. That's, that's right. That's right. I tried to do hashtag mile high NACAC, but it didn't really catch on. Well, they have a conference committee um, that has their own kind of unofficial Twitter happening, which is pretty cool. But um, nice. I want to make sure that we get into some of your research. Yes. So let's start with um, the the first piece of big research that you put out earlier this year. And, you know, if you can tell me a little bit about um, why you decided to pick on um, how many points of communication students were using and then what kind of findings you found out of that would be awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of that had to do with 
you know, is it seven? Is it 12? You know, the, the, the title we settled on was how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? Because the idea is that, you know, it, it, you don't really know. And it's, it's hard to say, you know, we, we need to send 20 view books and 10 postcards and 35 emails to get a student to be interested in the school. And what we found is it's, it's not really about the number of points of contact. It's about using the right Met, right communication channel at the right time and sending the information that students are looking for at that time. So it's focusing on the right information at the right time. Um, so we actually, we as part of our research, you know, we asked students, um, and I've got some slides here to share too, about how, about what was influential during their college search um, and what resources were most important. So let me pull those up. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so we have them. We get to see beautiful mountain ranges. Oh, you know what? You're not seeing my beautiful mountain ranges because I, I screwed that up. <laughs> oh. Well, can you, see, can you see those slides now? Yeah, let me bring it up a little bit closer for folks. Okay. And you should see them now. Okay, so, I mean, the first question we asked was, you know, what resources did students use during the various stages of their application process? And so this was... This first question was when they were doing their general search and getting information about colleges. And we found, I mean, we found across the board getting connected with students was by far and away the most important across the entire search. So we kind of took that out. And what we looked at was where the interesting trends were. So the first uh, was, you know, during their initial research, the most important was 80% of students said that reading information on the Internet about colleges was the most important uh, information that they could find. And we found that pretty interesting because that was above information directly from the school. And this kind of goes co correlates with um, Journal of College Admission came out with an article in the spring about secret shoppers and about how students are um, not just, they're not replying to traditional search outreach like schools are used to, like, the, like they have been in the past. And a lot of institutions see that as you know, stealth applicants trying to stay off of their radars, trying to stay, um, try, trying to kind of hide from them during the process. And my, my perspective is it's not that students are, are trying to hide from you as part of their process. It's that they're reaching out to you in ways that you're not necessarily used to. And I mean, they're maybe going on Zinch or the College Prowler or U.S. News and World Report, and they're evaluating institutions kind of together before re requesting information from those schools directly. And then if you're not if you're not working with Zinch or you're not working with, uh, if you're not partnered with institutions that can connect you with those students, then you're not going to necessarily get, get connected to those inquiries until they apply. So then they come through as what you would call a stealth applicant when in reality they've been trying to get connected to your school all along. Yeah, and that's a pretty interesting point. And I'm, I'm going to ask you to kind of uh, explain a little bit of what we're seeing in the slide because I'm not sure it's entirely clear for folks that are viewing. Um, but I did want to kind of back you up on that last statement because when we were at the Staymates conference um, and listening to the Teens Talk live um, presentation that was given, the students were absolutely in, you know, in agreement with what you just said and that they were going out to these third party sites to do their searching. Um, and I don't know if it was necessarily because they don't trust what we're providing them, but uh, it's easier for them to kind of compare schools when they're able to see all the same information delivered in the same format from one screen to the next. Um, so it's easy for them to kind of find these quick facts about universities on something like a U.S. News and World Report um, and go ahead and compare all their schools side by side yeah. rather than going from one website to another. Um, and then I think they're also really interested in the, the peer review that's out on those sites and having a little bit more of uh, a, a real look at uh, what the other people are saying about these institutions rather than just going to an admissions website uh, that's full of marketing material that's, you know, all polished and, you know, showing them just the good side of what's happening at the school. So, uh, yeah, so th that feedback from those students really was in line exactly with what you're saying here. But if you can just kind of break down a little bit more of uh, what exactly we're seeing on that slide, I think we can see some of the um, percentages and things pretty clearly, but um, not exactly... Um, the other details of what those are yeah. for. So. Yeah, so, I mean, to when you're looking at this slide, what you're seeing is, that, and really what you focus on is the initial research part of the chart, so that first kind of circle on the left, um, and what these are highlighting is that information from, the uh, information on the internet about colleges, which we consider things like U.S. News and World Report, Zinch, College Prowler, third-party kind of research sites, is the most important when students are kind of doing their initial research. 
And then second to that would be the information from schools that they've actually requested information from, which is the blue line. Um, that's a student who went to go talk to you at a college fair, filled out a card and said they wanted information. It's the student that went onto your website and filled out your information request form and said, I want information. So those direct inquiries that are requesting information from your school. Right. And then the third is actually, which I find interesting, is the yellow line is students were reading materials from schools they didn't actually necessarily request information from. And that's what we call search. You know, you buy the name, a list of names from PSAT, ACT, College Board, or CUA, whatever, and send them a send them a view book to to generate interest and introduce yourself to the students. And what I found interesting here is that this the initial being part of the initial research. This means that the direct, that type of direct mail is getting some some type of play with the students. But what I found, what we find interesting when we delve a little bit further, and I'm just going to kind of go on the fly here and go to the other slide. Um, is that of those of the students that said that they that they did receive the, the chart the pie chart there is students that said that they received messages from schools that they had not heard of before so that's tradition that's view books that's phone calls that's text messages and that's eighty four percent so I mean that most students are getting some type of search mail from from schools um, that that bought their name from some kind of service. Of those 84%, about 67% said that it had no influence on their decision to actually apply to those schools. Um, and some of this has to do with you know the timing of these messages, because a lot of times when a school does um, what we call senior search, um, they're, they're buying a uh, name of undecided seniors in January to try to generate more inquiries for their school. And that's going to kind of skew the results a little bit, because that's going to have a lower return when you're, when you're sending those type of messages to students. Um, so that's that's kind of how that that piece comes together. Is that the most influential pieces during the general research are the the mailers from schools students have requested information from and information on the internet. Um, the next the next data well, that we let, found is let's 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 back up and talk about that yeah. real quick because um, I you know I can see the I can see the value in wanting to target your market and, you know, really focusing on those students that absolutely want to be uh, on your radar and, you know, picking those students that are, are coming to you and are actively searching for you. Um, but, you know, uh, another way of looking at it is if you can select that larger group that includes all of the students that are eventually going to inquire with you regardless of um, whether you reach out to them or not, um, those ones that are going to go out and search for you, you can select that whole group and you can get that additional 33% um, that you can mail out to you. Why wouldn't you just go with that big selection? Why wouldn't you just go with you know, that traditional PSAT search um, and essentially buy the whole country, which a lot of schools do. They go out and they buy that whole selection and they don't need students to fill out inquiry cards anymore because they've already got them somewhere. So um, can you take that a step and kind of talk about what you think the value is in kind of leaving that old practice behind and really focusing on these this uh, group of students that are seeking you out instead? Yeah, I mean, I would say that my my... The my our research shows that the that you could do that, but the cost is very prohibitive. You know, to be able to buy, you could if you wanted to buy every student who took the PSAT nationwide. Right. Um, it would cost you thirty five cents per name, but then you also need to buy you also need to buy the postage for the mailer that you send them, the bit the mail the view book that you're sending them, the printing costs, the staff time, all that kind of stuff, and then to get a two to three percent response from that from that group is to generate your applicant pool. That's a that's a way to go, but that it gets pro when when budgets are getting cut and yeah. cost it's cost prohibitive. Absolutely. I would say that that's that's not necessarily the best way to reach those students. My recommendation would be just based on being able to step away from a year and kind of look at it from a from a perspective of this research is focus your resources on those students who have requested information from your school to optimize the yield of those students from inquiry to applicant and, and admitted student to enroll. So yep. take that extra postage money from your senior search in January. Don't give it back because you know you're never going to get it back if you do, but give it, use it for an admitted student reception. Use it for um, something like Integral for an online community. Cheap plug for Integral right there and I don't even work there. But use it for something like that 
and instead of instead of buying more names and sending more mailers and, and wasting more trees, you know, because students are becoming right. more uh, more concerned about that kind of stuff too with the environment and everything else. So yep. save on the environmental waste of the t- continued mailings and the emails that just get deleted. And that's where, yeah, it's, right. it's free to do, but it doesn't mean it necessarily works. Right. And so, I mean, great. That's a great point. And um, I'm wondering if you've taken it. Um, kind of another step and looked at what kinds of institutions this might be good for. Uh, You know, I'm at an institution where we're not really, we're fortunate enough not to have to be in the market of lead generation, you know, so when we're looking at different tools and things that are out there, um, the lead generation part is not what we're interested in. It's more of that connection with the student that we're interested in. So I can see, you know, even some of larger institutions like my own um, having a greater interest in some of, you know, some of these kinds of communications that are going to lead to a real connection with the student. Um, and so maybe it, maybe it would work like it for an institution like mine. Maybe it would work for those that also are looking for lead generation too. I don't know what your take is on that. Do you think this is for everyone? Do you think it's for certain kinds of schools? Uh, well, I mean, let's look at it from, I don't know, the perspective of the small to moderate sized regional institution, yep. private school, small endowment, high tuition, you know, the type of, the most schools are, are in that boat of, and, you know, and especially in the Northeast, for example, shifting demographics, you have the yeah. declining college bound student right in their backyard, trying to attract students from faraway areas. Yeah. It's going to be hard to just, fo- to just focus on those organic inquiries because that volume might not necessarily be there. So yeah, you do have to do some kind of, some kind of piece, but if there's a way to, only invest in things that are actually generating results like lead generation that's that's better than you know just buying a bunch of names and throwing a bunch of stuff against the wall and then hoping something sticks mm-hmm. um, so that's my 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 recommendation is to really you know evaluate what resources are 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 best I mean I won't go back to the slides but I mean there are shifts in what students see as impactful and important during their college search so if you invest in optimizing it for those resources at those times, you know, because, uh, I mean, Noel Levitz, did their, their expectations, and last year's the expectations, I know, had a question about um, students and their and their use of, web, of the college's website. You know, if they have a poor website experience, yes. 76% of students are never going to come back. Exactly. So focus on that, you know, because exactly. you're going to get organic traffic that way from the college prowlers and the Zinches and the U.S. News and World Reports of the right. uh, world that are going to direct students your way. Right. Great. So I didn't mean to kind of totally hijack uh, your flow there, but uh, let's let's keep moving. What other what other kinds of great data points do you have for us? Yeah, well, I mean, going back to the the shifting in importance of resources, and I'll show this share screen again, um, is the the idea of you know once a student's applied, how what what is most important, and what what happens here is there's a trend in things that not being that important to being more influential, things like speaking to faculty to college and speaking to guidance counselors. And these things have nothing to do with lead gen. They have nothing to do with, with generating inquiries. This is more the students who have applied or chosen to apply to your school. So I just, I think back to, you know, when I, when we set up, you know, general open houses or student shadow programs and wanted to introduce inquiries to faculty as quickly as possible because we felt that that was going to be very impactful. Yeah. I, I would say that if, if you have very um, involved and, and active faculty that want to assist with these kinds of things, great, do it. But in absence of that, because I mean, faculty are busy teaching your current students, they're busy with research, they're busy doing other things, maybe only in, only allow students who have at least applied to your school to meet with faculty members on your campus, because that's that costs nothing, but it costs you people time. So it's important to, to think about those things. And then guidance counselors, I, I mean, I, I look at this and I kind of th- I kind of take the them being not important during the initial research with you know, salt because I think students don't think that the guidance counselor is that important at the beginning of the process, but they're the ones that are facilitating all of the other parts of the process. So they they rise in importance after a student's applied because they're the ones processing their transcripts and letters of recommendation and all those sorts of things. But they're also the ones that introduce the students to the websites that they can use to research colleges, to the um, message, to the, to the different campus visit opportunities, tell them when the college reps are visiting the high schools, put together the college reps. And these are all things that I don't think students necessarily think about. So this isn't a poo-poo on what guidance counselors do slide. 
it's a look at how important how more how important they come throughout the process. Yep, and Gil, we actually don't have your slide right now. So oh. um I've got a little spinning wheel for you and hopefully it'll fire up, but maybe we want to switch back to webcam. Can you see me? I do. Okay. Got you back. So the chart goes like this. <laughs> um, the guidance counselors basically, when you look at that, if you remember back to that original slide, the guidance counselors are kind of low on the initial research piece, but then they go up in importance as the time goes by. And I, like I said, I think that is just a function of students don't necessarily think about what the guidance counselor are doing for them at that beginning part of the process. So guidance yep. counselors still are still important. Um, guidance counselors, I can tell you right now, I, I had a meeting with. Uh, counselors this morning and a big group of counselors and they are under a lot of pressure so much earlier because institutions are moving up these early deadlines on them. Um, they each were telling me that there are October 1 and October 15 early action deadlines that they're trying to meet um, and they just got into school. Um, they're, you know, they have kids coming in first day of school already having applied to colleges and so uh, I think we're going to, as we keep shifting around things that we do, um, those guidance counselors, you know, we're putting a strain on them and uh, their importance, I think, is, you know, going to keep shifting earlier and earlier in the process where kids are going to want to be communicating with them over the summer. They're going to want to be doing things before they leave junior year. So we need to be kind of conscious of our craziness when we want to try to lock in students early. Yeah. Um, it's putting a strain on all those resources. So and that's maybe where you help them out a little bit, and, and this is something that uh, I, I definitely talk about a lot during our presentations, is your communications to early inquiries, to those sophomores and juniors who are researching your school, coming to you, talk to you at a college fair, research, requesting information online. I mean, parents are crazy. They're bringing their freshmen to, to college fairs, all that kind of stuff. So, and you can tweet that, parents are crazy, hashtag Gil. Uh, <laughs> but I would say I would say that the the real, I mean, think about what your communication plan is for those early inquiries. A lot of schools don't have um, sophisticated early inquiry communications. You'll get an inquiry at a college fair from a, from a sophomore and it'll sit in your database for a year and a half until you send them your view book, you know? Right. Think about, I mean, I, I, when I was at New Haven, we, we started the development of what we call the sophomore's guide to college. And it was just a book of here's the things you need to do, you need to start doing sign up for PSATs, think about, you know, here think about signing up for SATs or early later on, put together your list, here's things to consider. Nothing really about the university at right. all except for our contact information if you have questions. And that's and that's where think about that cuz think about how you can help out the guidance counselors that you're work that you're trying to work with. Exactly, because you, you know, if you've got their inquiry early, they're going to get that important information from you when it's the right time to get it. But, you know, providing them with a prospectus, providing them with a bulletin or whatever you're sending out um, as freshmen and sophomores, it, that information is going to be outdated to them anyway, and you're going to end up sending something to them every single year. So um, I think that's a great point. And uh, out on the road, I saw a great piece from Seton Hall um, that was a checklist for students. So if you're out at a college fair, go and snag that, steal that from them. They've got a great one. Yeah, and go talk to um, Champlain College about their guidance counselor kind of outreach program because they have a guidance counselor newsletter that they send out via email. They do a, a program with all the schools in Vermont where they do it. And a lot of schools do this with yep. the bus tours of, of campuses, but they host them on campus for a yep. day. Um, and they have really good responses with that. So talk to them about that program too. Awesome. But it's important to engage the guidance counselors and provide them with resources. I mean, the other thing, what you mentioned guidance counselors are like overly bombarded with uh, requests and information and stress. A lot of them are just crisis counselors and stuff now. They're helping out students right. with more just college search. I mean, they don't think about things like test prep, you know, getting right. a student involved in PSAT, SAT prep, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, you mentioned at the beginning as part of our plug, but Zinch Prep is a, a program we're doing that's free, free college advisement for students. It's just mm -hmm. what's part of college application, what's the important pieces, what's part, what's part, important parts of your college decision, yep. SAT prep with Schmoop, all that kind of yep. stuff. So it's awesome. using those free resources, and as a college helping out the counselors and introducing your students to those free resources so that they're not uh, kind of lost in the shuffle. Definitely, definitely. We're, we're getting into a whole new show topic now. <laughs> Absolutely, and I'm happy to come back. Hashtag. <laughs> so then, the la I mean, all of this research kind of, to kind of bring it back to the research, but yep. all this research kind of inspired us to kind of continue with it as a, and like we mentioned before, it's just to help 
are help out the institutions of higher education with knowledge and access to this information. We we just finished the 2012 social admissions report with Integral. Yep. Uh, we're also doing a research project around um, parent perspective, parent the parents of college bound students and their perspectives and guidance counselor perspectives. Um, and underrepresented students and how to serve them and underserved, underserving or serving the underserved and that sort of stuff. So those are all things that are coming down the pike. Uh, but the most recent one is obviously the social admissions report where we, we ask students about what networks that they're using and that sort of stuff. Because I find that a lot of schools are kind of falling in that boat of, oh, we need to have every icon of every network on our homepage because we want to be where students are. Um, and we wanted, to re we wanted to see if that was ne actually necessary or if there was a more efficient way. Um, and I mean, what we found is that Facebook is still king as far as um, what network that they're using. Twitter is on the rise, and I think the anecdotal evidence people have is students are on Twitter because their parents are on Facebook. Um, but I would I would say that they're still on Facebook. They're probably just getting more savvy with how they're using it with privacy settings. Exactly. Um, they're they're utilizing Facebook primarily uh, as as their social network, and that's the one they're most likely to use to research colleges using their social stream, um, yep. as in, you know, talking to their friends and asking them where they're, what they're looking at and going to school. Yep, and I think, you know, as we've been able to spend more time using these networks, as institutions, we're understanding how to use them more um, and what is working and how people are interacting, how students are interacting with them. And there are some great presentations that are out there, um, uh, you know, talking about Facebook. Um, and when Brandon from Integral was on a couple of weeks ago. I think he, I think he's predicting where uh, social networking is going for these students and talking about, um, you know, making smaller niche networks and um, running with those. And I think that's a little bit what Twitter provides folks. You know, it's still that big open communication platform if you have an open uh, account and you're not locked down, but you can mm -hmm. really narrow your conversations um, and just communicate with a smaller group. And so. Um, if you haven't seen that presentation uh, or that show that we've done with Brandon, that one, he's he's predicting a lot of change with uh, private social networks and things, um, and I think he's spot on. But, um, you know, hopefully that's the same, uh, the same findings that you're seeing there with students kind of making a shift away from Facebook and m maybe gravitating towards Twitter a little bit more because they can find a more niche network there. Yeah, I, th I think students definitely have a line where... There's where they kind of do general research and get anecdotal information about mm -hmm. schools, and that's where they go on Facebook and, and are starting to utilize Twitter. Yep. But then there is that kind of line where they need to actually connect with that school and request information from yep. that school, and that's where they'll do the college prowlers inch kind of route. Yep. And then, I mean, 75% of our students, when we ask them in the social admissions report, if they would join a social network created by the, the school for the students, mm -hmm. said yes. Yep. So I think that then there's that point of they would join that community. And it's likely something that's built on the Facebook platform, but it's still, they would join that kind of private community for students at the school. And that is, I mean, it's great for schools to understand that, you know, there's the recruitment piece of Facebook, there's the inquiry gen and and engagement side with this with the, the student stream of like of a zinch chegg kind of experience and then there's the integral facebook platform built environment to kind of re re retain and yield those students right. and i think if you think about it that way it's a pretty it's a pretty fluid kind of Thing. Yeah, and when you think about it, you know, and that's a way to think about it from the college's perspective, but when you're thinking about it from a student perspective, um, and the same way that I kind of interact with other brands and not just other colleges, but um, when you're searching, you're usually searching on the web. You know, I, I don't go out and look for a brand and say, oh, I want to find out more about this brand. I'm going to go to Facebook to find out more about them. I'll search on the web, find mm -hmm. sites or find sites that will help me aggregate that content about that certain industry. So something like a Zinch. So you're out on the web doing that search. Um, and then you might be pointed to their presence on Facebook. You might be pointed to their presence on Twitter. And if you're someone that uses those networks, yes, you're going to like them. Yes, you're going to want to follow along because you want that information fed to your stream. And then as a student, you know, if you're still like, thinking about the student 
perspective and they're, you know, they're farther down the funnel, they've committed to a university, they want to kind of, uh, as Brandon would say, they kind of want to shed their, their high school skin and move into this new personality that they're hoping, you know, to make when they move into college. Um, and so they're very willing to be a part of a private network of all new peers and kind of start brand new um, and be in a new space. So, you know, it makes a lot of sense to me coming from that other, from the student's perspective, just as much as it should make sense to institutions to want to engage in those different areas too. Yeah. And I mean, I would say going back to that kind of search phase and the connecting with schools phase mm -hmm. is that, I mean, that's why a student would connect with a school on a site like Zinch because Zinch is for them, the kind of first professional presence. They create that profile that they can share with schools. That's not their Facebook. I mean, that's why students are making, making up fake names on Facebook is because they read these articles about college admissions counselors researching them on Facebook. So they, they name themselves Mickey Mouse or they name themselves Hulk Hogan or whatever they want to call themselves so that they're not found. But when they create those accounts, those are, that's how they want to be seen. Just like we have our Facebook page, Facebook accounts for our friends and family and, and whatever. But we also have our LinkedIn accounts that we have for our professional presence and resumes and referrals and everything else. It's the Absolutely. same kind of thought process just at the high school student to college student um, level. And that's why it's important for, for colleges to I mean, realize that students are, are doing those things. But I would say that in addition to going onto Google and typing in university of so-and-so, yep. when, you're, when you're getting ready to buy something, a lot of times you'll go onto your Facebook and you'll post, hey, I'm getting to, I did it when I bought a lawnmower. I said, hey, I'm looking at these two lawnmowers. It's exciting. Which one's better? And people, you get a million and a half comments. Yes. I mean, my in law knows everything about everything garden tool related. So you get, that's how, and that's how you're getting kind of your trusted circle opinions. And that's, that's kind of the idea. I mean, yeah, you'll do your general search and, and like you said before, go on to, go on to Zinch and, or College Prowler or US News and review the school side to side, right. but then you're ultimately going to want to get kind of that inside scoop and a lot of that can come from just posting a question on Facebook. Hey, I'm looking at Clemson. Who, who, who's been to Clemson and yeah. go from there. And yeah. um, one network that we haven't kind of touched on, but one that I think um, does provide a lot of valuable content to students when they're in that part of their search is YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. If there's any social network that I would go in and try to see what the college is really like, I would go into YouTube and put that institution in and see what shows up because that's a place where you're going to find some, real content good um, or bad good or all the good all the bad all together yeah. and, um, I, and, and usually the bad comes to the surface but. yeah and we, we talked a lot about youtube with the social admissions report and we um what we really classify youtube as is, is more of a video repository than a community like an online community because you don't go on to youtube to like have conversations and that sort of stuff for the most part um but yeah i mean youtube you need to leverage it because i mean it's a great way to Repop, repurpose that content to Twitter and to Facebook and have it on your website all in one place. Yeah. And it's a great way to kind of kind of introduce students to that to that content um, pretty quickly and easily. And I mean, and that goes to things like Instagram and Pinterest and all those sorts of things. Those are all kind of the tertiary niche networks. And those are, I mean, those are going to, they're all going to serve a purpose. But if, if your Facebook page isn't humming and you don't have a, a million likes and you're not getting strong engagement on all your posts or you're, you don't have a million followers on Twitter and you're not getting good engagement on your posts, then you shouldn't really bother with something like Instagram or Twitter or, or Pinterest because you're, you're not, you don't have the, ba the basic network to down. I mean, I would say if you're going to have like St. John's University, great example, they have an amazing Instagram account. But what they do with it is they take their Instagram photos and they stream them through their Facebook and they stream them through their Twitter. So student in our, in our, our, our research showed, you know, eight, not close to 90% of students use Facebook and they use it frequently. Um, and the next closest network is Twitter, which is less than half of that. And then everything else kind of falls underneath. And I would say that students, it's not that students don't use Insta Instagram or Pinterest, it's just that they don't necessarily know that they're consuming the content from it. It's coming into their feed, they're not necessarily posting to it, but they're consuming the content as opposed to producing content. Right, and nor do they care where it's coming from. Yeah. They want it delivered to them where they're used to seeing it. They don't want to have to go out and follow you over here and go out and follow you over here and go to all these different places to just receive your content in a silo. If they want to follow you on Facebook, give them the information on Facebook. Now, I'm not saying 
go and have everything on every single stream that you have delivering the same content. Um, yeah. You know, I, I'm not a proponent of tweeting the exact same things that are on Facebook, but... Um, you mean a hashtag on Facebook doesn't do anything? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> And, you know, and, and I think you made another really great point that is if you're not focusing on these primary networks um, and you're excited about 12 different networks and you're doing each a little bit or, you know, you may be probably doing each kind of subpar rather than taking two and really rocking them. Um, you know, you're not doing you're not doing a, a service to those students that are really looking for the valuable content that can be delivered just over one platform. Yeah. You know, if you're and I mean, I'll be the first to admit in my prior life at my prior institution, I was the first one to create a Google Buzz account. I was the first one to create a Google Plus account. I was the first one to create a High Five account, a MySpace account, like trying to get on all of these to yeah. manage our brand and connect right. with as many students as possible. And I'll be the first to admit, I was wrong. I think it's, it's more so about focusing your efforts. Just like with our research on student engagement and their preferences, it's about the right channel and the right information at the right time. Mm -hmm. And with, face, with social networks, it's about the right channel to connect with the right amount of students. And there are ways to leverage the smaller niche networks well, but it's in tandem with the larger ones for the most part. I mean, if you're a design school or a music school, that sort of stuff, you can probably use... YouTube by itself, or you can use Instagram by itself in very fun and creative ways. But I would say that the average institution is going to really focus on um, is going to really benefit more from using Facebook and Twitter for for general engagement. Some with a balance of a strong a strong website that has easy to find information because everything you post on those social networks, you can go to your website and if it's Absolutely. hard to navigate, you're going to lose them then anyway Absolutely. with a strong kind of lead gen engagement presence and a strong yield presence. And then from there, and that, to go back to the earlier conversation, you know, if you're an institution that's starving for inquiries because you're a new school or you're, you're trying to raise your academic profile or whatever it is, mm -hmm. that will kind of work there. If you're a school that's not struggling for inquiries because you're a household name, you still are competing with other schools because students are, are considering other institutions and they do have options. Yep. So you need to focus on that yield and engagement and getting those right students into your funnel. So awesome. I would say that, I mean, it can work. Using that kind of approach can work for most schools. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, so, I mean, as we're wrapping up here, um, because we are coming up on um, my uh, magic time, which is quarter of eight, um, I, you know, I am excited about you guys presenting this all over, um, but I also want to be sensitive to those folks that can't make it out to conferences, and it's something that I, I really feel strongly about, um, is delivering all of these messages to people that can't make it out to Denver, um, can't make it to those regional conferences where you're going to be presenting. So uh, I think you just wrapped up a lot of um, what you, we have talked about in the last hour. But um, for, you know, for folks that have been walking away from your presentations, um, what are, you know, last kind of tidbits that you hope they're taking away? And if they're going to go out and do anything at their institutions tomorrow, um, what would be the biggest takeaway that you hope they're leaving with? Uh, I think, honestly, the biggest takeaway is, is, and I get this a lot at the end of the presentations, is people come up and they say, you know, this makes us think a lot about the things that we're doing uh, with regards to our recruitment and what we're investing our resources in. And I think it's the, the easy answer is be, just be strategic with, what you're investing your time and and budget in and look at where you're getting the best results and it's you if you do that then you're going to do a better job of serving the students who are most interested in your school and make and taking care of them um, i mean i would say that at, in a perfect world the money that you save by not doing inefficient things you can put towards scholarships to make education more affordable now that's not necessarily going to happen because you're going to find other things to use that budget on. But if that budget is spent on making students experiences better, you're gonna you're you're halfway there anyway. Yeah, so I, I say focus on focus on efficiency is the most important thing. And I can tell you, we're going to be feeling the pinch. I mean, we all know, and we've been having this conversation inside and out amongst you know our higher ed circles about cost of tuition and you know it being incredibly unsustainable and what the heck are we going to do and so thinking about 
where you can save money now while you're not in crisis, while you're not about to close your doors because you haven't been thinking about these strategies beforehand. Um, you know, do it now. Try it now um, while you're not in crisis. What can you do to help save and help, you know, help save these students tuition dollars? And so that is a great point. Um, that is a high note for me uh, on the show. So I want to leave it at that. And I want to encourage folks, if you are heading out to, um, do you want to uh, tell us where you're going to be presenting, um, wrapping up the rest of the year? Because it's not just NACAC. Uh, well, we're doing a, a series of webinars in the fall, because um, I know a lot of people are traveling and mobile and that sort of stuff. Awesome. Um, and we are presenting, uh, we're presenting a session on international recruitment at NACAC and our student engagement presentation at NACAC. Um, and actually, most of the conferences that we'll be, we'll be at are going to be starting in the spring. So the regional ACACs in the spring. Um, so just keep an eye on those calendars, but also obviously with, with our, with the data we keep getting back from all of our surveys and programs, we're going to be doing webinars at least twice a month on new topics and, and data and, and information and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, and these, are, these are free, these are free webinars. You can't yep. afford not to. So absolutely make sure you hit up Gail. Um, we'll keep promoting it here on admissions live. And I want to give a quick plug to the NECA conference um, coming up next week. Um, I'm going to be out there in Denver. I'm hoping to do a lot at, while I'm out there doing some live blogging, doing some interviews. I'm hoping to grab people um, and chat with them about what they're excited about, um, what kind of issues we're facing here in higher ed. And so if you are going to be out at the conference, I want to see you. I want to talk to you. Um, and next week on Admissions Live, I'm going to be doing a NACAC 12 preview. So if you are heading out to the conference, um, I'm going to be chatting with some of the conference um, committee. I'm going to be talking with some folks that have been, some folks that are going to be new to the conference to kind of give you a rundown on what to expect, what to be excited about. And for those of you that can't make it, um, I am here for you. Uh, I'm going to be here hopefully delivering the content that you're not able to get because I can tell you there is a very slim chance that um, I would have been able to attend this conference without some begging and pleading and getting a conference proposal um, put in there. So I feel you. If you're not there, I want to deliver all the great info to you. And so I hope you tune in next week. Um, we'll be doing that NACAC preview show Tuesday night at 7 p.m. And you know where it's at, HighRedLive.com. Um, thanks again, Gil, for coming on. Um, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Um, and I'm bummed you're not going to be in Denver, but um, yeah. we'll be in touch. Having a kid, so it's worth it. Having a kid is totally worth it. Oh, no, I just told the world. Ah! Congrats, man. Thanks. All right, folks. We are out. We'll see you next Tuesday.